Hey everyone, it's Ormloo, and it's time for another part of State of the Civs 2023. So for those who have not seen the earlier segments, State of the Civs is a short series I do around the start of a new year, where we take a holistic look at all of the Civs in AoE2 right now, assessing not just how balanced they are, but also how cohesive is their design. Basically, do these Civs feel like a natural part of the AoE2 roster? Are they unique? Do they have situations where they shine and situations where they struggle? Do their bonuses feel gimmicky or out of place? That sort of thing. In an attempt to quantify these fairly nebulous concepts, as well as to keep track of all of the different civs in the game, we're going to be placing everybody on a modified tier list. I explained what I mean by the different tiers in the first part of the series, so be sure to check it out if you have not seen it yet. Of course, this is episode 5, and since we are going in alphabetical order, today we will be assessing the Lithuanians, Magyars, Malay, Malians, Mayans, and Mongols. Lastly, if you guys are excited for this breakdown, be sure to leave a like on the video, comment on what you think of the civs we cover, and subscribe to the channel for tons more AoE2 content. Intro done, let's get into it. We begin today with the only Civ for this video that does not start with the letter M, the Lithuanians. Joining the game as part of the Last Khan's expansion, the Lithuanians are classified by the tech tree as a cavalry and monk civilization, and their bonuses certainly point you in that direction. In fact, the Civ's most memorable bonus combines this idea with the Lithuanian cavalry gaining plus one attack for each relic garrison, with a maximum of plus four. This is one of the most conditionally powerful bonuses in the game, as its strength all depends on how much map control you're able to grab in the mid-game. Thankfully for Lithuanians, they have some nice tools to help them get there. Starting with an extra 150 wood always gets the sieve out and running quickly, and has a wide array of applications one might not expect. Especially for hybrid maps, Lithuanians have enough starting food to send their first four villagers to wood, granting them enough resources to build an early dock and fishing ship without causing any idle TC time. Even for land maps, Lithuanians can go for an early drush or quick feudal age time for open maps, as well as early castle age times on closed maps. Faster working monasteries help get you to those early monk battles or relic collecting much more easily, and that should get you nicely set up in the mid-game. Later on, Lithuanians have paladins or their deadly latest unique unit for gold power units, supported by skirmishers and spearmen that benefit from a very useful civ bonus and unique tech. All of this is rounded out by gunpowder and winged hussars, and you can see Lithuanians are not really going to struggle to find useful units in the later stages of the game, with or without gold. When it comes to how Lithuanians fit into the large roster of cavalry civs in AoE 2, I think the civ has a niche as the very military-focused monk and cavalry civ with strong trash units, but lacking in terms of economy. These guys are about grabbing the initiative, because if the Lithuanian player falls behind in feudal age, they can simply get outpaced by stronger economy civs, especially if it means being stuck in their base and unable to collect relics. This is important, because if Lithuanians cannot make use of their supercharged cavalry, the civ has no bonus whatsoever to their gold units, and without Blast Furnace, their knights are going to be subpar in the late game without those relics. So when I made the series last year, I placed Lithuanian in the somewhat problematic tier. The Civ is certainly distinctive and interesting with their cavalry, monks, and trash, but the way they played out has kind of created some problems. In particular, hybrid maps were absolutely top tier for Lithuanians, and last year Ornlu felt that created some issues when it came to balancing. Also, I was not, and am still not, the biggest fan of the Relic bonus because it just rewards you even more when you are already ahead. That said, a lot of people really like the bonus, and when compared to Civs like Burgundians, Sicilians, and Gujars, it doesn't really feel all that bad. Nowadays, I guess my opinion on Lithuanians is a little bit better than it used to be, and despite not receiving any balance changes in 2022, I will be bumping up the Civ to the something is off tier. I really like the flavor of Lithuanians, their unique units are both super powerful, perhaps too much so in the case of the latest, but that's kind of borderline, but overall the Civ is fun and viable to play in a number of different settings. For the second Civ today, we must take a short trek across the Carpathians to meet the Magyars. This civilization was added as part of the Forgotten expansion, and is also going to have the designation of Cavalry Civilization by the Tech Tree. In general, Magyars are a very aggressive Civ who attack early and never let up. This identity comes in the form of two bonuses, their cheaper scouts and free melee attack upgrades. These combine to give Magyars one of the deadliest scout rushes in the game on open maps, although their men-at-arms rush is not half bad either. In the mid-game, Magyars can go for archers, cav archers, and knights quite effectively, somewhat similar to the Huns, but likely focused a bit more on heavy cavalry. Where the Civ is really going to come online is in the late game, as if fully upgraded paladins and arbalests aren't enough, the combo of recurve bow heavy cav archers and the Magyar Hussar unique unit is one of the most cost efficient armies in the game. In particular, Magyar Hussars can very effectively snipe siege weapons thanks to some bonus damage, and have such solid base stats that they can even trade decently versus gold units. Especially on open maps, it is very difficult to grind down a Magyar's player whose army is stronger and faster than yours. Of course, Magyars have several weaknesses that set them apart from other cav 
cavalry civilizations. First and foremost, they don't have any eco bonus whatsoever, which means that any opening that is not a discounted scout rush will feel quite slow, which distinguishes them from Mongols and Lithuanians, who both feel much more flexible in their early aggression. Then, going to the mid-game, Magyars are stuck with only free attack upgrades for their melee units as a useful bonus, which can lead the Civ to feel quite generic, a weakness that will carry all the way until post-imp. Sure, Magyar Hussars plus Heavy Cavarchers are awesome, but it can be very difficult to ever actually get there. This Civ has all the tools it needs to successfully apply early pressure, but it also usually needs to get an advantage from that pressure, lest the Magyars simply get bulldozed by stronger civs in the castle and early imperial age. With all of that said, 12 months ago I placed Magyars into the something is off tier, but added that I felt that the civ situation would better be characterized as something is missing. The overall identity of the aggressive European civ that still maintains some of its steppe nomadic roots works just fine, and the civ can certainly shine on the more aggressive and open maps, but at the end of the day it still feels like there is something missing. Villagers killing wolves in one strike is fine, if not an affront to my kindred, but is not likely going to play a large role in most games. Same goes for their team bonus of extra archer line of sight. There are many aspects of Magyars that just feel really generic, and an extra bonus, especially like a mid-game oriented eco bonus, would be quite welcome in my opinion. So because Magyars have received no balance changes in the last year, nor has their place in the meta really shifted, I will continue to place them in the something is off tier for this year. This is not a Lithuanian situation where the Civ feels gimmicky or problematic in many settings. In fact, this is the opposite problem. Magyars just feel a little bland in all but the most open and aggressive settings. Next up, we are going to cover a very different type of Civ, and that is going to be the Malay. This civilization was added as part of the Rise of the Rajas, and is interestingly the only one in the game to have exclusively a naval designation by the tech tree. Yes, the Malay are good on water, but they can also work just fine on land maps as well. Much of this is going to come from the Civ's main economy bonus. They advance to the next age 66% faster. In case it's not clear as to how exactly this helps your economy, when executed properly, a Malay player can get an extra two villagers worth of saved TC work time when clicking up to the Feudal Age, and another three villagers on the way to Castle Age. This makes the Civ comfortably ahead by two to five-ish villagers, depending on the game state and map type. Combine this with a much faster Imperial Age, and Malay have quite a bit going for their economy. And all of this is not to mention water maps, where the cheap and super long-lasting fish traps give Malay the single most efficient wood-to-food conversion in the game. We're talking more than double the food of a post-imp Sicilian farm with a Chinese ally. So what do Malay do with all of that economy? Well, the only military bonus for the Civ is the cheaper battle elephants, which can certainly be a potent option in certain situations, but beyond that, this Civ tends to play with archers and infantry at most stages of the game, supplemented by solid monks and bombard cannons. Archers in particular work really well with the timing-based nature of the Civ with all the fast uptimes, while if things go late, Malay can utilize their excellent trash with fully upgraded halberdiers, skirmishers, and even their no-gold two-handed swordsmen to level buildings and other trash units. As to how Malay compare to the other naval and infantry types of civs in the game, these guys are definitely going to be the most economy focused. Unlike other strong naval civs, Malay have no direct military bonuses to help them fight on the water other than harbors, so it's more about having the eco to constantly produce navy than the ships themselves. On land, Malay are vulnerable in the early feudal age on open maps, kind of like Chinese. It takes a little bit of time for the eco advantage to kick in, which can effectively remove their ability to open with something like fast men at arms. Lastly, the most memorable weakness of the Malay is their abysmal non-elephant cavalry, as the Civ is the only one in the game that has access to a stable, but this is even chain barding armor. Now last year I ended up placing Malay in the almost there tier because I really do enjoy the identity and playstyle of the Civ. These guys take the cheap but weak horde of units idea in a fun direction, coming in the form of the .5 pop space karambit warriors, cheap but weak elephants, and even the two-handed trashmen with forced levy. They don't have the production speed of goths, but they do have far better defenses and a wider array of units. The reason Malay didn't make it to the complete tier was the implementation of the harbor unique building, which just feels super underwhelming. Unfortunately, my dreams of distinct harbor buildings that cost stone but are much stronger have yet to be realized, as the only change the Civ got in 2022 was that they received Treadmill Crane, a nice deathmatch change that also helps the Civ spam defenses in the late game in RM, but overall far from enough to bump Malay up from the almost there tier. We're still one harbor change away from being good to go with this Civ. As we move on to another continent, we are next going to talk about the Malians. This African Kingdom civilization is classified as having an infantry focus, which I guess could work, but in reality Malians are all about aggression and flexibility. In large part, this is due to their early game bonus of cheaper wood cost for all buildings except farms, as well as the extra pierce armor for infantry giving the Civ a deadly men-at-arms rush. As you progress through the mid-game, Malians possess the single 
single broadest Castle Age tech tree, having every single unit in tech other than the various regional units. This works well when it comes to making tech switches, which are further facilitated by the cheaper buildings. Imperial Age is where things can get a bit tricky for the Malians, as the Civ's lack of important upgrades such as Bracer, Halberdier, Siege Ram, and Blast Furnace can make finding the right army composition difficult. Nevertheless, Malians can go for champions with extra pierce armor, cavalry with extra attack, and Gabettos to lay down damage from range, as well as solid monks and gunpowder. So there are options there, you just need to kind of look a bit. Rounding out the Civ's otherwise lackluster late game, Malians have one of the few strong late game eco bonuses, with gold mines that last 30% longer, meaning the Civ has more opportunities to play with its stronger units. Working with this flexible theme, Malians are viable in a number of different settings, although the Civ will get to shine more on the more aggressive and hybrid maps. In particular, the wood savings on hybrid maps make them quite powerful there. On Nomad especially, those same savings allow the Malians to build a fishing ship right away, in itself launching the Civ to the top tier. Of course, this flexibility has its drawbacks, as the Civ can often struggle to find a specific unit that is strong enough to overwhelm their enemies. Champ Scarls are good versus archers, but lack a bit in terms of raw strength. Furimba Cavalry has that general strength, but not enough to compare to a full cavalry sieve. Gabettos have a ton of power, but are also expensive and fragile. I think you guys get the idea. In a world where the overall strength of sieves is at its highest, Malians can struggle to compete in certain situations in a variety of game modes. And that brings us to the question of where to put the Malians. So last year, I did place the sieve in the complete tier, because as it stood, Malians were interesting, flavorful, and viable in plenty of different settings. In many ways, they are like a more aggressive Chinese, excellent at going for a number of different unit compositions, but not excelling too much in any one area. All of that is still very much true, and Malians have received no changes over the past year. However, with the addition of new, powerful civilizations, it does feel like Malians are missing something outside of Nomad, and because of that, I will be placing the Civ in the almost there tier for 2023. This does feel kind of weird, knocking a Civ down from complete to almost there without receiving any changes, but in the case of Malians, it's really more of a balance issue instead of a true design flaw. The bar for what makes a civilization in AoE 2 strong is raised every year, and perhaps Malians could use a little bit of extra spice to help get them there. Still a very fun Civ for sure, but in this day and age, you really need a good reason to pick any Civ in a given setting. Venturing now to our fourth new continent in a row, the penultimate Civ of the day will be the tryhard classic, the Mayans. This archer civilization is of course from the Age of Conquerors expansion, and is the meso twin of the Aztec. In fact, as our final American Civ in general, Mayans will be rounding out the crew by focusing on cheap, cost-efficient armies of archers and eagle warriors. Right off the bat, Mayans begin the game with an extra villager at the cost of 50 food. Other than meaning you start housed and have to grab loom right away, it does allow the Mayans player to be an extra villager ahead of their opponents by the time they reach feudal age. This is nice, but the real star of the show for Mayans is their 15% longer lasting resources, which in the early game means getting more out of all of your sheep, boar, deer, and forage bushes. These combined to allow Mayans to possess one of the strongest overall Dark Ages of any Civ, opening the opportunity to apply early pressure with a strong economy behind it. Getting to the mid-game, Mayans have the same flexibility between archers and eagle warriors available to all American Civs, but in this case, the strength really comes in the form of progressively discounted archers. This Civ can simply outmass almost any other when it comes to sheer numbers of units, continuing that snowball effect from the early game. As things progress later, Mayans are really all about two power units, plumed archers and El Dorado eagle warriors. Plumed are fast and tanky, providing some much needed durability and long-term efficiency to the Mayan army, and then El Dorado Eagle Warriors are, in general, the best version of one of the best units in AoE 2. So yeah, they good. Supplementing these units are the options for very cheap Arbalests, Hulche Javelinier Skirmishers, fully upgraded Halberdiers, and Siege Rams. Then finally, in the very late game, the Mayan longer-lasting resources comes back with a vengeance, giving them simply more to work with, especially in terms of gold and stone, compared to their opponents. Now, as mentioned earlier, compared to the the other American civs, Mayans are really all about cost efficiency over raw damage like Aztecs, or flexibility like Incas. Mayans do archers and eagles well, and that is often all they need to get a win. There is a downside to this, however, and that is how Mayans can really struggle when population efficiency becomes a factor. Eagles and plumed archers are your best bets there, but even so, they can die hard to heavy cavalry and siege. Famously, Mayans have a really tough time against the champion plus onager combo, which is why you don't see the civ finding a ton of success on closed maps these days. That said, Mayans Mayans are so strong and smooth to play on open maps that they have always been among the very best and are at least solid enough to play on most other map types. Last year, I made the controversial decision to place Mayans in the complete tier because they are an iconic civilization with plenty of strengths and yes, weaknesses. If you only look at Arabia, then yes, Mayans are inarguably top tier, but when looking at maps as a whole, I 
think the Civ is in a pretty good spot. The devs seem to agree, as the only change the Civ received in 2022 was that their fishermen and fishing ships correctly benefit from the longer lasting resource bonus. So yeah, Mayans get to remain in the complete tier for another year. Last but certainly not least for today will be my all-time favorite civilization, the Mongols. This Age of Kings classic represents the original steppe nomad and cav archer archetype as depicted in AoE 2, and indeed the game classifies them as a cavalry archer civilization. These guys are very much famous for two things, a lightning quick dark age and a devastatingly strong imperial age. Starting with the early game, Mongols have some of the best dark age bonuses out there. The faster working hunters give them so much extra food early on that it is usually the case where the Mongol player can advance to feudal age faster than their opponent. Then the extra scout line of sight allows you to better find all of your early game resources, strategic points on the map to control, and even give you a bit of extra time to push in deer. As to what Mongols do after their fast opening, well there is a ton of variety. Archers and cavalry are your go-tos with the Civ, with the rise in popularity of the Step Lancer giving them even more variety going into the mid game. Of course, mid game is more about survival with the Mongols, as the transition to late game and Mangudai is really what they're after. I don't think I need to speak at length as to why Mangudai are one of the strongest units in all of AoE 2. They're fast, ranged, possess a ton of damage, and even have bonus versus siege weapons. Complementing Mangudai, Mongols still have very strong Hussars and even Step Lancers with extra HP, and of course you cannot forget about the speedy siege weapons with the drill technology. This Civ is typically not short of options in the late game on basically any map type. Now, when it comes to what makes Mongols unique among other AoE 2 Civs, they really need to zero in on this dichotomy between the super strong early and late game with the very mediocre mid game. Yes, Mongols are strong aggressively, but unlike the other nomadic Civs of Tadars, Huns, and Humans, Mongols really need to get damage done to cover for the fact that their mid game is so underwhelming. They're kind of like the Asian Magyars in that regard. Furthermore, their late game lacks a bit of flexibility as no access to halberdiers, good monks, or some important Imperial Age blacksmith text means the Civ is not wholly unstoppable in post -im. Lastly, we need to mention that so much of the Mongols' power is invested in the Mangadai unique unit, so that if they get their castles sniped, the Civ is kind of left floundering. So with that said, why did I only place Mongols in the almost their tier last year? Sure, the Civ is one of the most famous and popular in the game, it created the baseline for an entire archetype, and possessed some of the most dynamic gameplay of any out there. All of that's great. Unfortunately, Mongols also have the Nomad's Castle Age unique tech. Houses not losing population space when destroyed is arguably the weakest effect of any unique tech in the game, and it could really do with being replaced. It's not like Mongols need a ton to help them out in the later stages of the game, but something more useful could still be added there. Beyond that, Mongols received no direct changes in 2022, although I would argue that the recent renaissance of the Step Lancer unit in general makes the Civ feel that much more interesting in the mid game. Still, Nomad's remains unchanged, and until that tech gets an overhaul, the highest I can put Mongols is in the almost their tier. And with that, we have completed week 5 of our Civ reviews, a really solid selection of Civs this week, with all of them falling into the top 3 tiers. Of course, I'll continue to try and release these once a week every Friday, until we eventually get through all 42 Civs in the game. Lastly, I do want to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, with Tristan in the Great Wolf tier, and then Elvenor, Carolyn, and Donnie in the Dire Wolf tier. If you are interested in supporting my channel further and getting some extra perks, the link to my Patreon is always in the description. But as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.